So we're going to get started. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Employing Innovative Learning Methods to Educate Generation Z EMS Students. My name is Emily Klinsky. I am on the marketing team here at RealityWorks. Presenting today, we have with us Denise Dubois, our Real Care Product Manager. Denise has been with RealityWorks for 10 years and is a frequent presenter, trainer, and blogger, all things related to real care baby and health sciences. Denise has 20 years of education, marketing, product design, and curriculum writing experience. Before we get started, I wanted to cover a couple things. First, today's presentation will be recorded and all attendees will receive a link to that recording as well as a certificate of completion. We will have time at the end for a Q&A session, so please hold all questions till the end and we will cover as many as we can. With that being said, I'm gonna pass things over to Denise. For those of you just joining us, Denise has been our Real Care Product Manager at RealityWorks for the past 10 years. She is a frequent presenter, trainer, and blogger for all things related to Real Care Baby and Health Sciences. And Denise has over 20 years of education, marketing, marketing product design, and curriculum writing experience. So take it away, Denise. Thanks, Emily. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. On the screen, you'll see a few points of what we'll be discussing today. We'll take a look at just who are, who are today's EMS students and what does it take to reach and teach that Generation Z. Um, we'll be looking at ideas for engaging a Generation Z in lesson content. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those hands-on simulators, task trainers, and models that work well with this group. And of course, at the end, we will uh, finish up with a Q&A session. So we'll begin first with just who is today's EMS, uh, things that you may have had in the past, um, you know, very, very different. Uh, what we're teaching now, we are calling and defining as Generation Z. And whatever you knew about teaching millennials, well, you can forget it with this generation. Uh, this generation is very different in how they learn and view the world. Now, this generation is very tech savvy. Of course, while millennials were seen with things like two screens, Generation Z can go between as many as five screens. Think about the things that they use all the time, phones, tablets, computers, gaming devices. They can multitask between all of them and they tend to have uh, shorter attention spans. So they're used to those short things like tweets and, and like emails. And we are defining Generation Z as those students born between roughly 1995 through 2010. So research from Microsoft has found that the human attention span is shortening. At just eight seconds, they, may, they say it's now shorter than the attention span of the average goldfish. In 2000, it was 12 seconds. That is a difference of four seconds, a startling statistic. So as educators, how do we work with these goldfish? While it introduces some challenges, it also creates significant opportunities for us. So this is a big way and big change from the way we were probably taught in the past. Um, so for example, uh, years ago, PowerPoint was amazing. Uh, uh, TV went from black and white to color. We went from Nintendo to Super Mario Brothers and screens became magic. You know, so technology evolves um, on and on. So in school, it basically went, you know, here's a textbook, then you lectured and you had your exam, but that's no longer the case. In fact, this generation really requires us teachers to rethink the way we teach. And it's not always easy. So I looked at this generation and what are they doing? What's resonating with them? So let's take a, a look at a few of those things now. First of all, it's really all about the experience. Students read less and prefer that active hands-on learning. Now the statistic that students read less than 20% of the text, I think is very telling. If, if they're only reading 20%, how are they getting the other 80% of that content? They are also, also very future focused. They want to be successful, but they will disengage from the learning if they don't see the relevance. So as an instructor, um, anytime you can, make the connection, where will I use this in real life? Generation Z also views the internet and other online resources as many times knowing more than instructors. So if you ever had that student challenge you in class or even send you an email about something that they found online that contradicts the textbook or your lecture, well, they connect more easily also with teachers and professors as facilitators or guides in the classroom. So what else resonates with Gen Z? Again, the variety, hands-on doing. If you still use PowerPoints, which many of us do, 
try to do things like incorporate quizzes, activities, and hands-on demos every few slides to break it up. Now, try to provide them more than just textbook. So things like videos, online activities, group work, and models work very, very well with this age group. Use a variety to keep the attention and give them an experience. Now, try to be flexible in your teaching methods and in the way you communicate with your students. Give them choices, but also structured deliverables. And you may find yourself um, grappling with how do you make things interactive now if you are in an, a remote or online teaching situation where you're not in front of the students um, uh, person to person. Uh, a lot of the things we're sharing with you that resonate with uh, Generation Z can certainly be uh, used in an online uh, teaching format as well as in the classroom. Now, don't forget about the soft skills. That's another aspect we really want to concentrate on as educators. A widening gap is being noticed between the expectations of companies doing the hiring, the employment process, and the performance of the job applicants in the area of soft skills. Now, soft skills not only enhance employability for candidates, but they contribute to the company's success overall. Now, we know healthcare is a business where customer satisfaction is important. Since 2012, Medicare and Medicaid services began withholding hospitals Medicare reimbursement based on their quality of performance. 30% of the decisions derive from a measure of customer satisfaction. So let's talk more specifically about what's resonating with this Generation Z and just how do they learn? Well, here's an interesting statistic by a study from Barnes and Noble College. A recent report from uh, this college shows that Generation Z predominantly learns by doing and prefers active learning environments. Now there's a generation that thrives when given a challenge challenging, fully immersive educational experiences in which they can work through problems and really test their knowledge. And they are interested in steering their own personalized learning experiences and incorporating information from a variety of resources and materials. So what can we take from how they prefer to learn and use it in our classes? Well, let's take one specific example. Example: Generation Z loves video games. And have you heard of the video game Fortnite? Well, yes, Fortnite. You've, you've probably heard of the game that's taking this generation by storm, literally. Now, um, in case you're not familiar, uh, at a very high level, it's a co-op open map survival type of game. Now, it's controversial in the fact that it's a shooting game, but we're going to put, put aside that aspect for now and talk about the, the points of it that, that uh, really engage the students. So I asked some Gen Z students, what is it with Fortnite? What is it with this game? Why do you love playing it? And here's what they told me. First thing they said was, they get to work with their friends. But I'm thinking, but wait, I thought you hated group work in school. What makes this so different? So let's do a comparison. Gen Z likes control and flexibility. So now when I look at the comparison, I thought perhaps instructors need to rethink their group assignments. You know, this is just the way it's been done for years, right? Here's your group, here's your instructors, and, and have it done by X number of time. Can you give your students more control and flexibility? Now, the other attractive piece about the game is that it allows players to explore, gather materials, and create things. Now, the map changes with every game, and so do the locations of the materials, giving the player a new experience each and every time. So they really like to see things that um, mix it up. Next, Generation Z likes hands-on creativity. So again, let's take a look at the comparison with Fortnite. Fortnite promotes a lot of understanding through doing. It requires the players to plan ahead. So if they want to build something like a staircase, they have to decide on what kind and then gather the correct supplies. Now, school can tend to be repetitive. It might be the same routine in every class. So whenever we can, let's change it up and try to be as creative as possible. Now, we're also dealing with time constraints. We understand that. And many teachers say, you know, I don't have time to do all these different kinds of activities. Well, Generation Z does thrive on doing so. This is where simulation type of activities can come in to be very, very helpful. But we have to be careful that we're not just giving the information to the students. We want to let them discover along the way. Generation Z understands that not everyone's a winner. With that said, they believe that they get another try if unsuccessful. So it kind of goes back to the saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Now, an interesting fact is that this saying was published in a teacher's manual in 1840, and now we're applying it to students still today. Generation Z believes in second chances, so we need to think of where we can give students more than a chance to succeed. Now, we're not telling you that you have to you know, redo exam, let them redo exams and things like that, but what we are saying is that um, we should reflect on whether we're allowing students to truly learn from their mistakes. 
Remember, this generation is all about doing and redoing things. Now, there needs to be a balance, though, between building the knowledge and building the person. So think of things like that that, that uh, you could build into your teaching, not only in the classroom, but also in an online situation. I thought this was a very interesting statement, that st the students sitting in our classrooms are not different learners, but they do live in a world where how we learn is taking a dramatic shift. And boy, is that true lately. I think we've all experienced a dramatic shift, not only in um, how we're having to teach, but also the students, how they're having to learn in an online situation. Many of you are now uh, overnight having to do remote learning, online learning, virtual, a blended, all sorts of different situations. So um, we have to figure out how we can still uh, resonate and, and reach these Gen Z students um, in whatever environment we're teaching in. So let's take a look at some specific ideas for engaging Generation Z EMS students in lesson content. Now remember that you are creating an experience. You're competing with those video games like Fortnite. So um, we have one idea is the importance of topic introduction through a, a pre-activity. So we're setting the stage for that experience by introducing the concept in a simple way based on previous levels of experience. All of the health science and EMS simulators and task trainers from RealityWorks come with curriculum right in the lesson. Um, the first part of the lesson is called the focus section, and we start each lesson with a short but engaging way to get students interested in the content immediately. Now, on the screen here is an example of an introductory anatomy activity. Now, this could be done at the beginning of a lesson, introducing intramuscular injections. Now, you could take a few minutes to preview uh, prerequisite knowledge like anatomy that students should know before proceeding with the rest of the lesson. And something like this could be very easily adapted to an online format. Now, this is an example of an introductory empathy activity. So this, again, could be done at the beginning of a lesson, introducing uh, bleeding control and shock management. Um, so you'd have the students you know, read the example here, and this is specific to, to an EMS situation. And then you have the next step is have them reflect on the situation. You know, what emotions uh, were the person feeling in the, in the scenario? Um, what you, could you do? And then after they um, answer those reflection questions, then they could share their thoughts with a peer. Now, if you were in a traditional classroom face-to-face -face with your students, uh, you could do a think, pair, share kind of uh, situation where you pair your students up, they read through, the, the um, empathy scenario. Um, they talk together um, in the reflection questions and they share each of the thoughts with each other. Now in an online situation, you could post, pose or post the uh, introductory uh, scenario uh, as a written thing um, in your LMS system. You could pose the reflection questions again as something that students need to answer and then uh, submit to you. So that's how you could adapt something like that. Uh, discussions in class are also a great time to work on those soft skills. So we need to encourage the students to communicate with each other. It promotes teamwork and confidence in communicating with others. Students might not like to do group work, but seem more receptive if it's shorter in time. So again, pair and share. Since sometimes there are no exciting models to touch, we need to provide students with a scenario that causes them to critically think and challenges them. And that's um, kind of what that scenario in the prior slide did. As they read through it, it challenged them to try to uh, see how they would handle it. So in the introductory activities uh, students complete before the content is prevented or presented in reality works lessons, educators have a choice. You know that you could do that anatomy thing, you could do the empathy activity, or you could choose to do both of those as uh, pre-topic uh, pre introductory activities. It gets those students engaged in the content and gets them uh, their mindset and ready for the next part of the lesson. Now, we also think that demonstrations are attention grabbers. They're an excellent way to teach students to use new equipment or to teach the steps in a new process. They're also effective in teaching safety skills and common pitfalls. Allow your students to practice and have them um, have that hands-on experience as you coach them. They will make mistakes and it's important to encourage them to be successful. Combined with the opportunity for questions and answers, uh, demonstrations are a powerful and engaging form of training. And um, we know that demonstrations are used uh, widely in EMS and other health science allied health programs. Uh, let's take a look at scenario-based learning. 
Now, there are many benefits to scenario-based learning, and we'll just talk about a few here. It creates sticky learning experiences, meaning they will remember what they do. Facilitates problem solving in learners. So in scenario-based learning, it puts students in new and different situations. It provides guided exploration uh, for the learners, giving students explicit, thoughtful, critical thinking opportunities. It provides a safe place or zone to practice to proficiency and mastery. There is no fear or risk um, of the consequences. They, they can practice over and over safely. It allows uh, learners to make mistakes and through feedback, reinforce the right approach. Now's the time to practice so students will learn what to do when they come across situations in real life. Build their toolkit of responses and approaches. Now here's a nursing scenario focusing on problem solving. And any emergency responder can tell you how critical that skill is out in the field um, on a call. So I'm gonna read the scenario here. It's a pro and it focuses specific to problem solving. Eric and Tony, our first responder, is dispatched to the home of a 30-year-old male complaining of leg pain. Upon arrival, they find a conscious male lying on the couch in the living room complaining of bilateral leg pain with significant edema to both legs and feet. The patient is unable to ambulate and weighs approximately 400 pounds. He is very apologetic and keeps saying he's sorry he weighs so much. So you, you read the scenario, and another way you could use this is a wrap-up activity or a review activity at the end of a lesson that has introduced the skill and focused on problem solving. So again, you could use the scenario to kick off a lesson on problem solving or as an assessment at the end. Um, you could ask those key questions that are, that are on a scenario card that we provide. So there's three or four of them uh, for each of the scenarios. The key questions are really important to help your students apply the problem solving skills that they've learned in the lesson, as well as critical thinking. So something like um, our employability uh, scenario cards that we have for uh, EMTs, we have them for nursing, geriatric care, but all of them, all the cards have a specific soft skill focused um, in the scenario. And then they have points of view to consider in those key questions, but it's a very engaging and very easy way to get your students doing critical thinking and using their soft skills. Now, we've just shared one example of a scenario for EMTs. Um, while we have a set of these uh, cards that are ready to use, you could also create some of your own, but you don't have to do it all yourself. So here are a few creative ways to find or get scenarios for your own program to use. Uh, first of all, you could get industry involved, especially in your local community. Uh, many of you may have advisory boards that you could tap into for various health science CT programs. Talk to local employers in the areas you teach. Uh, tell them you're creating a class project and need help coming up with some real world scenarios that involve uh, different soft skills. Ask them about recent scenarios that they have experienced on the job. Another source is get your students involved. You could also ask students to create scenarios based on some of their own life and work experiences. Many students are now employed in their first jobs. So you could have them share either positive or negative scenarios that they have personally seen or been a part of. Um, talk to your colleagues. More than ever, schools are tapping into people from business and industry experience to teach. Maybe you have or know fellow teachers in your school or district that have worked in businesses and industry in the area you teach. Ask them for a few ideas for scenarios as well. Uh, you could also talk to family members who may work in career fields relating to your course area. What types of scenarios or situations have they seen or been a part of in a work environment? And then, of course, Google it. <laughs> you could do keyword searches on terms like role playing, uh, workplace scenarios, workforce conflict scenarios. You'd be surprised at the amount of scenarios that you can find that are ready to use uh, that you can just uh, use tomorrow in your classroom. Here's another idea for integrating soft skill content into your EMS courses, and we call it the time management challenge. Now, we all have days when our list of tasks is huge and the amount of time we have to complete them just isn't there. Well, when time is tight and your agenda is packed, you've got to prioritize tasks and work efficiently. So this activity will give students the opportunity to practice just that. So here's the scenario. They have a long list of tasks to complete in a limited time frame, and this requires them to work together as a group. So you make a list of tasks on chart paper or writing them down, and you assign a point value to each job. Uh, it could be something just generic like uh, do 25 jumping jacks for five points, um, make up a nickname for every member of your group for five points, get everybody to sign a piece of paper, etc. 
you just make a list of tasks and that take up to uh, that take more than 10 minutes to accomplish. Um, then you divide your students into groups of five or six and you give them 10 minutes to collect as many points as they can by deciding as a group which tasks from the list that they're going to perform. Now a debriefing session is essential with this game. You guide your students to think about how they made their decisions, which group dynamics came into play, how did they determine the value of each task and what they were going to do. Now you could also make a task list that directly ties to your EMS course content uh, using related tasks such as take a blood pressure, bandage something, apply a splint, and then in those list of tasks again you assign a point value. Now in an activity like this they'll actually practice things like negotiation, critical thinking, communication, and of course time management. Now Gen Z we want to remember one experiences and things like simulation, simulation through simulators, task trainers, and models are ideal ways to engage those Generation Z EMS students. So there are two main categories in simulation, low fidelity and high fidelity. Now low fidelity are realistic models that mimic areas such as anatomy and physiology. High fidelity are things like mannequins that can sometimes talk, breathe, bleed, make sounds, and of course both, both have pros and cons. So for the low fidelity, we know many times they're less expensive, certainly to purchase and maintain. Um, many of them do have a realistic look and feel. You can uh, purchase a larger number of models for students to use, and it takes a, a limited amount of training to operate, and many times they're more portable. However, on the con side, they may not be as fancy and realistic as that high fidelity mannequin. Now, High fidelity uh, mannequins can be very expensive, sometimes more than $100,000, and they, have, they can also have maintenance fees and software fees and things like that. However, their realism is, is uh, sometimes very, very, very lifelike, um, have more, more technology for students and faculty. You know, students can get very excited about high fidelity, um, but they can develop negative feelings if they don't learn anything. Many times you've got sim labs that have these high fidelity simulators that perhaps can only um, have one or two students using them at a time, perhaps only a couple of times during a semester. Whereas when you, you uh, so they may be more uh, better suited for a higher level uh, students uh, learning more advanced skills. Uh, low fidelity are those, those workhorse trainers, those things that you can get in your beginning student's hands to uh, practice on over and over again. So there are definitely uh, room for both in, in programs. Uh, just think about uh, the, th the objectives you're trying to teach and which uh, fidelity or which mode best matches your objective. Research by Goodstone explored the development of critical thinking for students who received instruction using high fidelity patient simulation versus low. Now both types of fidelity showed an increase in critical thinking and an increase in empathy as well. So both types of fidelity were very positive. The key is again, use the appropriate type of fidelity that creates the required perception of realism that allows participants to engage in a relevant manner. Now here at RealityWorks, we have a wide assortment of wearable simulators. Now some of the simulators give the wearer real life experiences such as pregnancy or trauma wound suits. Students can feel and build empathy regarding pregnancy or experiencing a bleeding wound when they have the wearables on. Other wearables can give the peer the experience of completing a procedure on a patient such as wound care or IV insertion. Just think of the difference um, a student feels completing a procedure on a standalone trainer versus one connected to a live person. So wearable simulators really are a powerful tool uh, to use with Generation Z. So let's think a little bit about the evolution of task trainers. In our allied health programs years ago, students used oranges as models to practice injections on. And students back then thought that was very innovative. Then we started to see trainers that looked more like actual skin and that was amazing. And nowadays we even have the ability to have better models that have the layers of the skin. I guess the message here is, if possible, don't settle for the orange. There are many task trainers that you can use to practice specific EMS skills available. For example, here's an upper arm intramuscular injection trainer that not only teaches anatomy on one side, but it also gives the students feedback. For example, if the student injects into the wrong depth or the wrong location, a buzzer will sound and lights will show that a nerve was hit. Remember, Gen Z thinks of us as facilitators and would rather get, have a device given them feedback, perhaps, than us. 
So these types of task trainers would be a great fit for Generation Z. Uh, think about moulage. Early moulage started out as wax models of diseases and anatomy hundreds of years ago. Now, some instructors prefer to create their own moulage and integrate it into very specific scenarios. Now we have moulage wounds that can go on mannequins or on real people that, that look extremely realistic. A moulage is a great tool for Generation Z. They can wear it for the experience through the eyes of a patient. They can also assess it and document it as a healthcare professional. So what makes a trainer or moulage model a good one? It has to look and feel real. You know when you have a good trainer, when the students buy into it, they like it. Maybe they say, ooh, that's so cool or disgusting. And then they treat it like real anatomy. Some of the most realistic training aids I've seen are actually used for military, for combat medical training. And we are starting to see more of these types of tools in secondary and post-secondary EMS programs. Secondly, the task trainer needs to do what it says it will. It will if it, it is real, if it works. Moulage model must look like the condition it's supposed to then it will work. Third, it matches the curriculum. You can take the best looking uh, simulator, task trainer, or moulage model, but if, it, if you cannot use it to meet the lesson objective or if students need to pretend too much, it's uh, perhaps not the best choice. Now let's take a look at anatomical models. Most of the time, any student wanting to pursue training in a health science pathway program of study must take anatomy and physiology as a required course. Anatomical models are a staple in these courses. Some anatomical models are relief models, while others may have many removable parts and pieces to help students get that hands-on practice learning anatomical landmarks. We know that technology keeps evolving, and now we even have tools that use virtual reality glasses, holograms, and more. And if some of you have found yourself in an online learning environment, you may even have found a software, anatomy and phys software online that um, helps students uh, take apart the body to get a closer look as well. There's a lot of different tools out there and anything you can do to uh, get students engaged and get them um, actively learning rather than just passively reading uh, will really resonate with them. So remember that we need to include students in the learning process and give them an experience that they will remember. It's really about a lot of the hands-on learning. So identify the content you teach and then think about what resources do you already have that are hands-on learning tools? Where are the gaps where you need more resources? Find a few sim new simulators, task trainers, or models you can bring into your program. Uh, what teaching strategies can you use to increase retention with your Gen Z students? We've discussed a few already, but here is one of the best. Take time to reflect. At the end of the experience, make sure facilitators reflect or um, make sure to facilitate reflection whether you need a, you've used a simulator a task trainer a model or scenarios um, ask students to answer questions like how did it go how did you feel during the experience did it meet the outcomes how can you make this a good experience for your patient or how will this experience change the way you deal with patients in the future so there are a lot of very good meaty a debrief and reflection questions that you can get your students to answer. It could be orally as a discussion, or it could even be a writing activity. So now what? We've given you a lot of uh, uh, different tools and ideas today, a lot of information, and, but you're like, well, where do I start? We know that you've got a lot on your plate, especially now if you've ended up changing from an in-person classroom environment to the online learning environment. Uh, first, we just recommend just start slow. Um, Choose a few ideas, give them a try, see what works. And someday you will be back into your traditional classroom again with your students doing a lot of hands-on activities. Um, remember, those low fidelity training tools can be just as effective as high fidelity training tools. So pick a few ideas, try them in your program, see how it goes. A second, if you are interested, you can go to our website and download a free infographic on experiential learning and why it works for today's students. The link is on the screen in front of you. Um, you'll find there, uh, the infographic also talks about health career growth. And we also have a free week-long unit on health science career exploration that you could also get a few ideas for and try out in your program. So Emily, I'm going to throw it back to you right now to uh, take any questions that we might have had from our participants during the last half hour. Okay, it looks Okay, it looks like we do have one question um, regarding our curriculum. Is our curriculum online? 
Um, when you purchase a product from RealityWorks, you receive a link that takes you to a URL and it, that's where you actually uh, ex, um, access the curriculum. So it's online in that you get it at a URL or a website. However, um, they are not uh, interactive online where it's like a fill in, uh, fill in types of things for students to do as an online course, but the, the assets themselves are available online to be accessed. So you could uh, print them out, you could import them into an LMS if you've got a, a PDF converter and things like that. Okay. And it looks like that covers all of our questions. Um, just questions on if you're, they're gonna be receiving a copy of the PowerPoint slides. Um, you will be receiving a copy of the, the webinar recording, which, of which you'll be able to see the slides on that, on that uh, recording. Um, after the webinar. That's good. Well, it looks like that covers all of our questions. Thank you everybody for um, taking the time with us today and we will be sending out the recorded link as well as the content survey as mentioned earlier. Thank you very much everybody. Thank you. Have a great day.